Thank you, as always, for listening to Caleb vs. Self. On this episode, I speak with Aaron Carnes, author of In Defense of Ska. We talk about how people get into Ska, the importance of the history of Ska, and how new generations are starting to make Ska a piece of their own. You can find the book online pretty much anywhere you buy books. Uh, you can find the podcast In Defense of Ska anywhere you also listen to music. Check out any and all of the social media by Aaron Carnes and In Defense of Ska just by searching In Defense of Ska. I had a ton of fun talking with Aaron, having this interesting conversation, especially with the generational differences as far as Ska is concerned. Hopefully, you guys enjoy. So, Aaron, like I said before, thank you so much for making some time and hopping on here. Sure, happy to. Um, ska music. Yeah. Why? Why? And I know you outline a lot of this in the book, but just in a summation for you, why do you feel like it gets such a bad rap? Why does ska get a bad rap? That's a complicated question, but I think that there's a couple main points. I think that the fact that... I know, actually, let me let me preface this... Uh, this um, question and also my answer in that sure ska tends to get a bad rap in the u.s i think it's a pretty much a u.s centric narrative which is why my book is so focused on u.s ska because that's really where ska is kind of uh dismissed and looked down upon i think if you go to a lot of other countries ska it's popular in various degrees but it doesn't tend to get that sort of um bad rap You know, and in some countries, it's particularly big and like like Mexico or or Japan or some of these other places, various countries in Europe, um, Latin America. Whether or not it's super big in any of these given countries, it's not really looked at like, oh, my God, that's so that's so embarrassing. You know, people (laughs) trying to pretend that they never were into the music or, you know, journalists outright dismissing it and, and critics like unwilling to review it and, you know, all of those things. Anyways, that's it's it's a it's a U.S. thing. So let's keep that in mind as I answer that question, because I think that there's definitely a, an issue in the U.S. of of um, happy music. I think I don't know what it is. Happy music doesn't sit right with a lot of people, a lot of a lot of tastemakers, a lot of people trying to be cool. Um that music Scott comes on. It doesn't matter if it's like Scottalites. It doesn't matter if it's, uh, you know, the political force, you know, that is the specials. It still sounds joyous. You know, it's just the sound of it is joyous. And I think that rubs people the wrong way. And uh, you, you couple that with sort of the journey that Scott took in this country. It went from being obscure, you know, DIY scene to being, launched into the mainstream in a huge way and in a way that really didn't uh, understand the context of where this music came from or understood the subculture. And so it was presented as just like the latest trend, you know, the nineties were really big on the latest trend. I mean, this cycled through these things, you know, they subcultures were pulled out of the underground left and right, and they were constantly um, mischaracterized or simplified You know, grunge is a great example because grunge wasn't even really, it was presented as this scene more than it really was. I mean, there just happened to be, you know, some rock and roll bands and, uh, you know, maybe they had some similar influences, you know, that gave it a some similarity. But, you know, if you even listen to like, you know, compare Mudhoney to Nirvana, it's not that similar. So the, the 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 mainstream media, as it was becoming popular, had to really make it seem like it was the scene and this like movement. And they would even highlight things like the fact that they wore flannel seemed to carry some importance. But really, it was just a it had to do with the fact that they were Seattle bands and Seattle's cold. And that's how people dress in Seattle. So Scott went through the same thing, but probably worse, in my opinion, because Scott had a longer history, a longer legacy, a healthier underground scene um, with comp- complicated subgenres and, you know, different styles within that. And, you know, even if you were a part of it, you know, it was a little complicated to kind of under- to explain, like, 
yes, you have this music. It started in Jamaica. It kind of, it, it evolved into reggae. And then it got revived in the late seventies in a new way in England. And then it kind of traveled all over the world. And, you know, in the U S you had bands that kind of carried on the two tone legacy for a while, but then you had bands like fishbone and operation Ivy really gave it this new sound that was very American. And it went in all these different directions, but you had all these bands that were still doing like traditional style and some bands that were very pop punk oriented and, and hardcore and, these were all like kind of different subgenres that coexisted. And there was like thousands of bands. There was zines, there was touring, you know, pretty nice touring network kind of established record labels. Okay. Then all of a sudden, you know, you have like six or seven bands that are launched into the mainstream and it's, it's, this is ska, this is ska. And um, so many people had no awareness of everything that led up to that. And so it just seemed like this weird, thing that came out of nowhere to so many people and it had horns and it like most of the bands that got popular were kind of zany and they wore colorful clothes and then it kind of you know went out of fashion so so many people what they think of when they think of a ska is that and they think that it was this goofy trend by a bunch of like dorky kids from orange county so right that's mostly why ska is embarrassing because that's what people they they think that's what ska is. They don't understand the 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 depth and complexity. And it's not just the history, not just the history that it came from Jamaica, but the depth that was the ska scene even at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole DIY scene that existed at the same time, the the bands like Hepcat and and these, you know, other bands that were doing a very different version of ska at the same time who were popular in their own right. So I, my main defense in my book, I I take some specific defenses, but my main defense is to educate and expand the knowledge of ska because I, my theory is that if people know more about ska, if they know about more bands, if they know about more aspects of the subculture, they will be less likely to make fun of it and be, you know, either they'll, they'll appreciate some of it or they'll just you know, feel like, okay, well, maybe my, my dumb superficial jokes don't quite line up to the reality of it. Right. Right. Well, I I think what's interesting about that, when you talk about it being like, you know, positive and upbeat, at least in the feeling of the music, not necessarily the lyrics in every song, although there's plenty of, you Mm -hmm. know, wacky zany songs out there, uh, lyrically, what I find interesting about it, at least for me growing up. and, And again, when we first got on, I started reading the book. I'm only like 40 pages into it, but immediately my first reaction is, oh, I don't know shit about Ska, even though I was a Ska fan in high school. Mm -hmm. What I found interesting about Ska, especially in high school and at that time, was the accessibility of starting a band. It felt more like a high school jazz band that you can just do more rock stuff with. And I felt like that was a lot of the entry point, at least for my generation. I'm about 30, 32 in mm-hmm. my generation, that's where a lot of that came from. Do you find, at least in the later, I guess, millennial and now, I don't know if Gen Z even, <laughs> if if there's a big culture, you know, with the Gen Zers, is that what you hear a lot from, you know, the post 90s era people who got into ska? Or is it a different type of, of story for people who find ska after its heyday? Or I should say the third wave. So you... um so in the in the late 90s, you were like too young to be aware of ska. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. So what were the what were the bands that you first discovered? Was it like Big D or uh, was it some of the 90s bands like Real Big Fish? Because they were yes. still kicking around. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That um, Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. Yeah. So um, that's what I find. I find a lot of a lot of people who got into ska after the 90s. It was a combination of the handful of bands that continued to tour, which was Boss Tones for a while, although they stopped. Real Big Fish kind of never stopped. Less Than Jake didn't stop. They would kind of go go in and out of being more ska-oriented or not. Um, The Toasters, I don't think they stopped. So those would often be the entry points for for younger people. And um, then it's kind of like, a you know, then then they're also the bands that are still putting out records and are touring a lot. And then there's also like, depending on where you live, there might be like a local scene. And that really varied, you know, in the 2000s, that really varied, to, you know, location to location. 
Did you have a local scene where you grew up? No, no. Okay. I, I grew up in Rochester, New York, so I'm out in Western New York. And the scene for ska was very like um, high school battle of the bands. And, and like I said, it was more accessible because, you know, every high school has, you know, orchestra or jazz band or concert band or whatever they called it. So you could easily get a couple of horns and people who could play them, you know, relatively well. So it would cover up or mask some of the uh, maybe deficiencies in the other. Because it's not like a lot of kids got went to school or public school and played guitar or drums, you know, in that style. But it felt more accessible. <laughs> so you would have the battle of the bands and, you you know, we'd be, oh, yeah, well, you know, we could throw together something. That's kind of more or less where it came from. And then once you started getting the images, the the checkerboard and the the rude boys logo looking things the you know all that type of imagery started uh, at least for me hitting and being like this is cool like i like this this you know black and white checker this two-tone pattern this this type of stuff to me was cool and to your point what you said before that kind of has that kind of nerdy uh i don't know annotation or i don't know how you would describe that but that's kind of at least for me where it birthed from so i'm always curious as to like how other people discover it sure yeah i mean i think that's not not an atypical story for your age and you know and like i said i think it depends on where you were living um i i got into the music before it got mainstream and there was i feel like a lot less of that Cause I feel like the mainstream kind of really pushed that. And then that, it kind of lingered for a while after like these sort of <laughs> these visual um, and nothing wrong with like, you know, visual, like the checkerboard or whatever, but that's not really didn't feel like that important to me and to my peers and to the bands that I was interested in, you know, yes, there was some bands that were very interested in the, in the traditional stuff, but they, to them, it, you know, it seemed, this deep knowledge for the the old subcultures that dro- drove them you know the people that were really into suits and the fashion and stuff so those were people that were like knew the history back backwards and forwards and that's why they that's why they they were like carry on that legacy whereas like a lot of the other bands the ones that were more punk oriented they were kind of like pushing against that and being like we're doing new stuff and we're kind of rejecting the the old way to do it and we're we're redefining how to do it. So they weren't they weren't really coming to this notion of like, you know, it's it's about checkerboards or it's about Hawaiian shirts. I mean, every band kind of did their own thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Real big fish were were kind of Hawaiian shirts were their thing. It wasn't really a ska thing, but because they got so popular, it kind of put this Hawaiian shirt connection to ska. And same with like money, money, boss tones and like plaid was uniquely their thing. But, you know, to a lot of people that it had some sort of significance to ska. So I think like, you know, some of the lingering effects of it having been in the mainstream and so you have this like mix, this mix of real knowledge and, and bad knowledge of like what, what is ska and what isn't like kind of like, yeah, kind of carried on to your generation where it was like all these like these visual images and symbols and stuff. Like, I mean, I, I don't know, like, again, like th- that stuff didn't seem that important in the early nineties. It was like, everybody dressed totally different. The bands dressed different. It was about the music and about the the scene itself. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's, I don't know, to me, I, I, I really like that. I really like that aspect to it. And I, um, it also didn't seem like it was geeky or nerdy. I mean, nothing wrong with geeky or nerdy, but it just didn't seem like that was. I didn't immediately associate those two things at the time. It wasn't until it wasn't until it was on TV. I feel like that became a bigger thing. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. But the impact, that lingering impact, yeah. I think, is what I'm guessing. And I haven't finished reading the book, but I'm guessing that's what a lot of my generation was missing to really appreciate Ska for what it what it is and even what it became to some degree. Mm-hmm. Like I had no idea the history of, of, of the, the second wave, if you will, and how it was anti-racism and, you know, sure. all that type of, of stuff. I, I don't know. 
I had no idea. All I knew was, you know, we're skanking around. We're having a good time. We're just being, you know, free to express whatever it is that we want to express in that given moment. You know what I mean? Like, that's what it yeah. felt like then. I had no idea of the history. And I feel like that was, looking back on that, a key piece to really appreciating and having that that appreciation that could carry over for a longer period of time, unlike what it did, at least for my generation. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like the bands that were getting popular in the nineties and the fans, we definitely had, you know, you, you, it wasn't, it wasn't handed to you the knowledge of where Scott came from, but most of us, were eager learners and, and we quickly learned that, oh yeah, there was, you know, you go back, you go back a decade and there's two-tone ska and then you go back another decade and, and there's Jamaican ska. You know, we, I remember going, taking that journey pretty quick once I got into the music. So, and I feel like pretty much all the people that I knew that were ska fans, we had a, a at least a basic understanding of, of ska history and the, the the anti-racist roots the political roots all these things and we we you know even even bands you know i know real big fish those band that that's not a political band but they know and they respect the history of ska you know what i mean they, they yeah. yeah yeah um so that was seemed like a truth in the 90s yeah I, it's it is interesting the 2000s it's also interesting because like in a lot of ways pop culture really really went further into looking down at ska like you know in that time period the time period you're describing like mm-hmm. you see um like the the first chapter i think you've read the first chapter there's there was all this like sudden like issue with like bands like um ha- i mean there was like if a band member used to be in a ska band it was like they would they were outed for being like you know <laughs> it was the worst thing it was the worst piece of pr for them like it it was like it was like everyone feared it was career ending if you know like some band oh your drummer used to be in a ska band you know it was like a big it was like a actual a big actual deal um because it you know what what was popular in in the mid 2000s in in sort of alternative music was like very very serious music uh, kind of, you know, like this post-punk stuff that's like very manicured, you know, it's very manicured image and very uh, the opposite of what they yeah. projected Sky image to be. It's, so, a, it's that emo scene, that emo scene, 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 scene the, if you will. Yeah, it was like the emo yeah. scene. Then there was also like the the, the sort of post-punk bands like um, the Bravery and, and those guys, you know, the, all that different stuff was all very popular at that time. So, mm-hmm. and, but so many of those bands had ska roots though. That's the funny thing, you know, cause when they were younger, there was a good chance that they had at least played in a ska band for a, a short time. So. Right. They don't well, want anyone to know played. about it. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta hide that dirty laundry. So nobody finds out. Yeah. But um, I guess, you know, someone who's younger, like the younger generation, like yours, I don't know if you're quite affected by that in high school yet. I'm not sure if you felt a difference when you got a little older. As far as the view of Ska. Of, yeah. No, no, no. Um, how, yeah. Ska, I think for most people, especially in, in, in my time, right. That mid two thousands, mm-hmm. it became like a, um, kind of like the cringe moment in your life. Right. That's what mm-hmm. it felt like after the fact, because, you were free to express whatever it was you wanted to express. You know what I mean? Like, again, you've got that, you know, upbeat, you've got that, uh, you know, simple, I I shouldn't say simple because it gets a lot more complicated. But when you first like start trying to write ska music, right, you've got your four beats, you've got your one, your three, it's very straightforward. um, But your expression in that was very like, whatever, like nobody cared what you were doing you know, skanking around for lack of, you know, any other term that I could think of. Um, but as you got older, it turned into like a kind of a cringe thing. Like I, I think of like on Reddit, I think there's like uh, like people posting like their old kindergarten picture when they had a bowl cut, you know, that type of stuff. That's what it felt like. Sure. Yeah. Did but you... starting to read this music and listening to some of your podcasts, the I can understand a little bit better now 
why that history is so important to appreciating the music for what it is. I feel like it's more important than a lot of other genres. Yeah. Sorry, did you have ahead. like, so did you uh, go away from the music? Yes. And then, so what, what got you interested in the music again or learning about it? Honestly, it was just coming across your book. So, so, I, so I go ahead, go ahead. So you, um, you saw my book or something and you're like, Oh, I used to like Scott. I'm curious to see what this guy has to say about it. Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. That's exactly what it was. Did you immediately resonate with the tone of the, the title and cover? Like it being like, yes. Um, yeah. So you immediately go like, Oh, I get it. Ska is embarrassing. And this guy's going to explain why maybe it's not so bad. Okay. I'm curious. Oh, it's t- very fascinating to me. That's exactly what it was. I was literally on Instagram scrolling around and being like, wait a minute. I remember being a, like playing in a Scott or I shouldn't say playing in a Scott band. Like we got together, we wrote like two or three songs and we played at a, a lock in at a bowling alley in high school, mm. which is a very like, you know, at that time, that was a, you know, it felt like the Scott thing to do, but yeah, <laughs> just scrolling around and I see this and just the title of the book. I'm like, Oh yeah, I definitely understand why somebody would go out of their way to write about why Scott isn't, bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah some of the i mean I, i've learned about some of this stuff later but like some of the reference points to people who are younger than me i were not things that i was familiar with even at the time like um tony hawk is a is a very major is a huge major entry point to a lot of people huge huge uh, i didn't i never play I, I mean i have played tony hawk now but i at the time i didn't play tony hawk and i uh, I wasn't familiar with any of that, you know, cause I was, I don't know. It just, it just really didn't have interest to me. So it wasn't, a, you know, it wasn't a thing, but to other people, it was like, this was the very first exposure to ska music. Cause that Goldfinger song plays in like the opening scene or something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. So everyone heard that and, and that game was a huge hit. So there's, everybody has like different entry points to ska and it has an impact on sort of, their take on the music. And, and I, and I hope that whatever that entry point is that people spend more time and learn more about it because whatever your entry point is, even if it's the best possible entry point, there's so much more to the music than, you know, whatever that thing is. And, and I think this is true for all genres, but for some reason, like I think ska is like this thing where people are like, want to define it so specifically when in fact, like it's like, there's so many, it has so many facets. I mean, you can take like a band like um, Choking Victim, which are like anarchist punks who sing about, you know, how much they hate cops. And um, this still falls under the banner of ska, just like, um, you know, an OC, OC ska band does or like a, a soulful, like traditional ska band like Hepcat does. And I think it's a fun journey to kind of really see all the ways that people have taken this music and made something uniquely theirs out of it. Yeah, it's funny you bring up the Tony Hawk Pro Skater thing, because to me, that video game was the entry point for literally my whole generation as far as music. <laughs> if, every single song on that soundtrack, everybody knows, and they have that connection with it. And I remember specifically, yeah. there's a demo of Tony Hawk Pro Skater that we got from Toys R Us. You could only get the first level, but we played it so much that like you knew every you know you knew all the songs on the soundtrack and even now i might not be able to name it but as soon as i hear it i'm like oh tony hawk pro skater that game is a shit this song is awesome let's (laughs) fucking go (laughs) like yeah we um we interviewed uh jeremy from scott two network on on the podcast and, and they're also a friend and jeremy's like a little younger than you and I asked, I asked them, the very first question I asked them was, you know, what, how did you, what was your entry point to ska? And their answer surprised me. I, they said it was, um, the Digimon soundtrack. And, oh, uh, no kidding. Did you? Yeah. I was just like, huh, not, not on my radar at all. And, and after the interview, we talked about it for a while after the interview, I went, I went and listened to the soundtrack. I was like, oh, there's some ska songs on here. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeremy said that a lot of people their age got into ska from Digimon. So it's totally fascinating to me. 
yeah, there's a, a pretty wide reach in, in uh, I have to admit, I thumbed around in the book a little bit. I didn't realize how many, uh, like even HGTV and the Food Network and yeah. how many uses of ska tunes or, or sound bites there are throughout all of media, not just right the music or the video games, but it seems to be everywhere when you really pay attention and look around. Yeah, it seems like this it being background music really took off in the 2000s. I think um, once it stopped being, you know, once it stopped being at first, it was a it was an underground kind of DIY thing. And then it became like pop music. And then what, once it kind of faded from being pop music, I think people in media kind of like recognized that it had a certain vibe to it. And that that, that vibe was kind of lighthearted, kind of. It could be goofy, you know, if you, if you, if used right. And so they really jumped on it, you know, like America's funniest home videos, I think for a while really, you know, America's funniest home videos started when I was a teenager and there was no ska in it, but it, I think it turned, it, it adopted it much later and it really, really rode that out as, as best as they could, you know? Right. And, and so you see that in a lot of stuff happen in the two thousands, like, Oh, you got a you got a kind of a goofy scene, or you need a transition from this, and it's kind of happy. I mean, these are all things that really like suck the like <laughs> suck the depth out of ska to some degree. If you know that's all everybody's hearing is like background music, f- funny background music, you know, like dogs like tripping, and and that's it like, matches ska. I mean, nothing wrong with that, but you know, it's that's not like the most important thing about it. No, yeah, of course not. <laughs> so but, for a lot of people, that's what they hear. Yeah, I mean, like you said, that entry point can is so wide at this point, I feel like, for yeah. Ska, that you kind of, you get what you get, and you hopefully you get to the point where people check out this book and, and take the time. If anything, you know, they can even listen to the podcast, mm-hmm. uh, check out the book. I mean, there's a lot of ways to consume a lot of the history you have. But it's funny that you bring up uh, Jeremy because that was – through doing a lot of reading, listening to some podcasts of yours, um, the Scott to network and, and what Jeremy's putting together over there doing cover songs. Yeah. Uh, in, in a ska way, as far as the future of ska is, is that one of the ways you feel like that's going to be most effective, uh, bringing people back to ska, or do you feel like there's, I mean, you mentioned, you know, uh, other countries have a much larger, it sounds like at least, or, or a better yeah. perception of ska. Is there like a fourth wave of ska that I'm unaware of in another country? So, um, well, okay. There, there's a couple questions there. Okay, other yeah, countries, <laughs> other countries have had consistent ska scenes. Um, you know, uh, not necessarily this like rise and like dramatic rise and dramatic fall. Like the, our country has, I think it's been a little, little e- more even, um bands you know it, at the olympics the in, in japan they had the closing ceremony with a uh, tokyo ska paradise orchestra right this is a ska band from japan and people were like oh my god i can't believe there was a, a ska band uh playing the closing ceremony of the olympics well this band is huge in japan so it wasn't weird at all this is like an arena level band that every everybody in that country knows so it made perfect sense in that culture to have Tokyo ska paradise orchestra play the closing ceremony. Yeah. Of course it had been weird if in the U S Olympics, we like pulled out a, like real big fish and had them play out. People are like, what the hell's going on? Right. Uh, Mexico, you see um, ska bands really came into prominence in the late nineties. I mean, even though ska had been around there for a while, but it can really came into prominence. You see bands were getting on the radio and stuff in the, late nineties and early two thousands there. And, uh, there was some, you know, rises and falls of it in terms of like mainstream, but it stayed consistently popular bands are playing or, you know, before COVID bands were playing huge festivals, ska festivals in Mexico. So, uh, it's, it's, and a lot of the same bands that were popularized in, in the two thousands. So I don't even know, I wouldn't call it a wave at all. It's just, it's just a different, it's a different relationship to the music. Um, what Jeremy has done, I think has helped like a few years ago, bring people back to ska through the covers. I think we're at another, we're at a new level now where I think a lot of those people have already kind of taken some interest in it through the covers. 
And now you're seeing a lot of those same people checking out some of the new bands. And um, in fact, Jeremy will is going to be releasing a, an album of original music sometime in the very near future. And uh, I, I've heard some of it. It's really good. It's very original. And I think that's going to be something people are going to really dig. There's also bands like Cat Bite and, and We Are The Union who have been around over a decade, but they're sort of um, their new album, I feel like is in a way kind of a new band just because they've, the music's so different and, and the band is like gotten is much more different. Um, bad Operation from New Orleans. So there's, in in the US, there's lots of great new bands that have, some of them are, are just a few years old. Some of them are maybe, you know, a decade or two old, but they're, they're post nineties at least, you know, mm-hmm. and, and also at the same time, you're seeing like a lot of the, a lot of the nineties bands are, have been releasing new albums and there's been, been more interest than they've had in a while. Like there was way more interest in the last boss tones record than the, probably their last couple records. Um, Big D has an album coming out. There's like, I think there's a lot of interest in it as well. That's coming out, I think in October. So I think what, what the ska scene needs in general is just new music, new bands. And that's, I think it's, it's happening and that's what's going to keep people interested. And a lot of these new bands, the new younger bands, I think they're, they're very in touch with the roots of ska and the, 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 the politics of ska and, and representing that in the music. And so they're, they're bringing that to the forefront in a way that some of the mainstream nineties bands didn't really do as much. It definitely softened that. So I think that's going to help, you know, if people get into ska with some of these new bands, whether they're younger or if they're older people getting back into it, I think they're going to, they're going to be faced more with like, Oh, these are, these are bands with something to say. They're not being silly. Uh, it's fun, but it's got a message, you know, and yeah. I think that's often that's that was, you know, sort of what Scott was about. Having a real message towards something, not just. Yeah. And but having a good time, having a good time dancing, you know, like you said, like being free to express yourself. I mean, that's a that's an important part of Scott always has been. But I think also having something to say as well and uh, having something sincere to express. It doesn't have to be that you have something important to say about the world. It could be something about yourself. Um, You know what I mean? Just not your classic. I work at a burger shop tropes (laughs) and got famous type of thing. (laughs) That's fine too. But I mean, you know, I think it's, that needs to be balanced, you know, or at least people need to understand that that's just a piece of it. Yeah. Right. 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 And I feel like that, like, I I might be repeating myself a bit, but that's definitely something that sticks out. And now that I'm like rediscovering through your book and and your, especially your podcast, realizing how much more there is to all this Mm -hmm. really makes me like, Oh shit, I need to start getting back into this. I need to start listening to more. So for, for that, I know one of the most difficult things, at least for me today, just time wise is finding new music. Mm-hmm. I know that you're kind of in that scene, so it's sure. probably a little easier for you. But for for layman like myself, is there like an easier way to find out more uh, music or newer bands or newer releases, like in a simpler way, instead of having to dig around for everything? Or, um, you know, it, it, you can you can uh, check out Bad Time Records. That's a, definitely a good entry point for new bands. They are releasing a lot of the new bands that I think are really good and they're pretty consistent with their, with their releases. Um, like, you know, like the lot, pretty much all or most of the bands I mentioned, cat bite, bad time, um, bad operation. They, they're, they're working with bad time uh, with, um, yeah. Bad time records. Sorry. No, no, no worries. Um, you know, in terms of, yeah, it's just in terms of discovery, you know, if, if you, if you start discovering, bad time records and some of these artists and you start or, you know, or in defense of Scott, me, you know, start following us on social media. I think you'll, you'll quickly discover new music and, and just people talking about new music and talking about old music. A lot of times I feel like on, on social media on, on like Scott Twitter, so many discussions are about like these like lesser known 
uh, lesser appreciated uh, bands from back in the day. You know, there's a lot of like appreciation for like, like, oh, who were these like really good bands that didn't get the attention that they deserved? You know, there's so many of those conversations happening all the time. You know, bands like Emmy 330 or Slow Gherkin or some of these, you know, 90s ska bands that are just like, they weren't on the radio and they did really unique versions of ska and, and, and their music holds up really well. So, gotcha. I mean, those are, that's what I would suggest, you know? So for you, right. Sure. With your ska band back in the day, that experience, what sticks out to you the most getting into ska music and starting to play and starting with, uh, with, with flat planet and doing all that. Is there, is there a moment for you that really defines like your experience with ska? Um, I think that getting into the scene and getting to tour and meeting all the people in the bands was probably the most, was the best part of that experience. I think, um, you know, we, we met lots of great people that, you know, I, I grew up in a very small town, conservative family religious family and uh ska the ska scene was very closely tied into the diy punk scene and the sort of the politics of that and there was a like a very diverse group of people that were in the scene and that were like this music so i was exposed to a lot of different ideas and a lot of different people and also you know when we when we toured we uh, we got to see parts of the country that were very different where I grew up in. I grew up in, uh, you know, California. Um, so yeah, I think that's, you know, you know, cause our band, you know, our band wasn't at all big or anything. So I have no, nothing to say in terms of like, well, we did this and this and this, you know, we tried, but we didn't really get that far. But, you know, for my personal experiences, it was that that's what was really stick sticks out to me and was really valuable and has like impacted my life, you know, decades later. Um, I sometimes wonder if I would have, you know, progressive, good ideas about the world and, and no interesting people had I not started there as a teenager and early in a young adult through ska and the, and then the ska punk scene. Cause you know, Just otherwise, being exposed to yeah, otherwise I was in like, like church and youth group and, and yeah. these other things, which, um, <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty. It was kind of more on the extreme end of that, you know. The the church. I, I'm. I was growing up in a similar situation, and one of the things for ska music that uh, allowed me to kind of get into it a lot more was the fact that when, when uh, I mean, my parents were deaf, but when their friends that that could hear heard the music, they weren't like turned off by it immediately. You know, it wasn't punk. It wasn't metal. It wasn't. Yeah, you know, it was upbeat and it it sounded fun initially, right? Even yeah, so though some of the songs might harmless. have more of a message. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, same with you know, same with my mom. I mean, she didn't object to it, but you know, there was definitely lyrics on, in some of these bands that she would have objected, reject, would have not been cool with had she been able to hear it, or you know, or if she knew like <laughs> the politics and the lifestyles of some of these bands that I was like fans of or even became friends with you know like i was um skank and pickle were like my they were my favorite band you know they were my introduction to ska and they were the band i would see all the time and then i became friends with them and i roadied for them once and i just think you know she was like i think she just you know she's like skank and pickle it sounds silly but right <laughs> they're like very just like a lot of like a lot of like political songs and the, there's like a lot of drugs happening, you know, it's very, I just think it's kind of funny, like probably just like over her head that, that, that was the case. Well, I wonder how many people had, you know, again, similar experiences to you and I, where you could, your parents wouldn't mind letting you go to <laughs> maybe that show just because they only heard a snippet of one song. Sure, and it was yeah. like, you know, they, their impression of it initially was just like, Oh, it's just, you know, kind of whatever. Sure. Yeah, it's why not, not that, uh, you know, my older brother was really into like um, metal and like extreme music and drove her crazy and she hated it and they used to fight about it, you know? Yeah. So, but it's like, oh, 
<laughs> sure, Aaron, you can go to that. I yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that time uh, roading for Skanking Pickle. Like, what what was that experience like? Because I know you, you you were a fan. Obviously, you're really into him. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, if I read in the book correctly, you threw him a note and they they got you back. That must have been a very cool experience and probably made that really special for you. So how I got to know Skank and Pickle was I saw them play a show. Uh, It was like 1992. I didn't know what Scar was. Someone recommended I see this band Skank and Pickle because they were technically local to where I live. They, you know, they were from a nearby city. They were, they were kind of big already, but they were local. Saw them play totally, you know, fell in love with them and got to learn about what ska was, you know, that was my entry point. Um, I wrote a fan letter like the next day or like a day or two later, I sent it to Skank and Pickle cause I got the CD and the CD had an address and, um, they wrote back. Well, it turned out it was Mike Park. I didn't know at the time, but yeah, Mike Park wrote back and, you know, I wrote this like ridiculously long, fan letter that was purposely weird. I did it on purpose. Mostly I was like, I want to get, I just imagined that they got all these fan letters and right. uh, I wanted to stick out. I wanted them to be like, Oh, this is interesting. So I wrote just a super weird long one. And Mike wrote back. He's just like, and he, he really short one, but it was kind of like, he was like matching the weirdness. And I was like, cool. So I, I wrote like an even longer, weirder one. And then Mike wrote me back and he's like, here, here's my phone number. And then I, I started calling him and talking to him. Years later, he told me that he gave me his phone number because he didn't want to have to read like these long <laughs> letters I was sending. <laughs> so, yeah, we started like he started just like I started hanging out, go to the shows. And then like sometimes I just hang out with Mike and uh, some of the not as much the other members at first, but I did kind of get to know them because I was around them at the shows. Um, the, the, when I became a roadie, this was like a while later. So I pretty much knew everybody already. And Mike invited me because they didn't have a roadie on this one particular tour. It was just one tour and it was like two weeks in the Midwest. And, um, I even got paid for it, which surprised me. I really, I didn't anticipate getting paid. I was like, cool. This is like a two week trip in the Midwest. This is, I get to hang out and right. see shows every night. And so the, yeah, at the end of the, and at the end of week one, because they had a um, tour manager and it was like, you know, I guess they, that's how they do it on tour at the, the end of it, each week. They, 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 pay, the tour manager pays out the bands and band members and stuff. So he's paying out every band member, whatever their weekly thing is. And then he like comes up to me. He's like, here's your weekly salary for um, roadieing. I was like, Oh fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting money. On top of that, we were getting like daily, um, the clubs would do, they would pay you everybody like a certain amount of money. It was like, so like the, the band had part of their contract was um, the clubs either had to feed you or they would pay you a certain amount of stipend stipend. Yeah. And I think it was like 30, I don't know. I can't remember what it was, but it was, it was enough that if you, you could just, you could, you could eat Taco Bell or something cheap throughout the day with that amount of money. You know, you didn't, it it was enough to pay for like one nice meal or a bunch of like cheap meals. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was like 20, 20 or whatever. I didn't, you know, I wasn't trying to eat like a nice meal. So, you know, I was able to just kind of survive on that. So I was getting those and then, um, yeah, then I got salary. Um, it was, it was fun because, I had toured with Flat Planet at that point already three times and Flat Planet touring was the epitome of like just DIY punk rock touring. Like we were playing backyards and basements and skate parks and stuff. And we were, you know, we weren't getting paid very much money by the promoters and we would just sell shirts and we were lucky to just be breaking even sort of thing. And we were staying at um, people's houses. We would always ask people, let us stay at your house. And I think we only paid for a hotel once in our entire time. So that was my tour experience was just doing a lot of that. And and we didn't have a strict schedule because it was like whatever we felt like doing. Did we feel like driving all night 
uh, after a show and then getting there early? Did we feel like sleeping at someone's house and then getting a, you know, just getting there? You know, it was really just like very much we were driven by our, our young whims, you know, whatever we felt like doing and just had to be at the gig. And um, and it's not like we had to sound check. We just show up because there was a punk rock shows. So Skang and Pickle was like they were pretty big at that point, And it was like this rigid schedule and hotels. I mean, they weren't like rich or anything, but sure. it was like a entirely different um, experience of touring. It was like there was like check in at the at the van, like the tour manager would be like, you have to be at the van at this time. You have to check in and we're and then we have to leave at this time. And we have to be at this club, you know, it was like at this time to sound check and, you know, I had specific duties and it was very like, it was a, it was an entirely different experience. So that was a, that was an interesting thing about it, but it was fun. I mean, I feel like Skang and Pick were a little burnt out because they had been doing it for so long. And I think there was very little exciting about being in Milwaukee for the 10th time at this, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like n- n- nothing I was like, I would, we would get to the clubs. I, I'd never been in the Midwest because uh, Flat Planet always toured kind of in the South, Southwest, and then South, Southeast, sometimes mm-hmm. in the like lower Midwest. So most of these places I'd never been to at all. I'd never been to the, the, the proper Midwest. And so after we got there, we sound checked. I would just take off. I would just look around. I would just walk around and look at the city and explore and then i you know make sure i was back in time to for when the show started so it was exciting for me and i could tell everyone else in the band were like you know they just get to the club sound check <laughs> have some beers uh <laughs> you know what i mean yeah i they mean were, for them i'm sure at that point yeah every city looked like the last city and mm-hmm. every club looks like the city you know yeah yeah they're just living a groundhog's day when you do it probably as hard <laughs> as they did right yeah as far as ska in and of itself i know again you're a lot deeper into the culture but when people who you can tell haven't been exposed to ska have those conversations with you do you run into more people that are closeted ska fans or do you run into more people that are like i don't know what the hell this is it sure seems like people are like turning around a little bit on ska lately um when i started the book i started this book in like 2013 it was like a seven year process to write this. I finished it in like early, early 2020. Um, definitely. I was encountering a lot more like negativity towards ska in those early years. Not, not from the people I wanted to talk to, but just, you know, just the general attitude of people. But I feel like there's less and less of that. And like more people are like, yeah, yeah. I, I used to like ska or like, oh yeah, yeah. I, I remember ska. And I think, I think to some degree people my age are, open to being nostalgic, you know, even if they don't have a great history of ska, they're a little bit more open to being nostalgic and they're a little like less concerned with what's trendy or cool or uncool than they were when they were younger. Now that we're like, you know, in our forties, you know, who cares? Right. I think. Right. So, and then culture at large, I think is, is pivoting. It's a gentle pivot, but we're pivoting on ska because younger people don't carry the baggage that um, older people do with ska, like especially like like you were talking about Gen, Gen Z, yeah. Um, it is even more removed from this. Like, like what is the what's the problem with ska? Like, they're not even like in touch with a lot of this. Like, the negative history or the like, the it being a cringe thing. Like, that's just like less and less and less of a thing. Be, yeah, they are just it's too young to be connected to that. Yeah. Well, I mean this week, you know, doing reading and listening to your podcast, I was sitting there. I've got a, I've got two little girls love of my life. And I turned on, um, which, uh, what was it? Real big fish sell out just the music video. Mm -hmm. And my daughter's like, I like that song. She's four. (laughs) So (laughs) I, I can imagine like that, not having all that baggage probably helps. What I found really cool in the podcast episodes that I've been listen, able to listen to so far was the one with um, Ian, the comedian there. Uh, mm-hmm. Was that a couple of weeks ago? Ian Fidance. His, yeah. Yes, Ian Fide, Thank you, Ian Fidance. His story of having your book sitting in, well, I think it was like a hairdresser chair and the hairdresser being like, oh my God, you like Scott? 
<laughs> I, I'm I'm definitely going to do that with this book. I'm going to go yeah. to work and leave it on my desk and see see if anyone who says reacts? anything at all. Yeah, right. Exactly. I I will have a very close eye at who walks by my cubicle and who stops for a half a second and goes, "Wait a minute." You yeah, you also have like so like I would say the younger like Gen Gen Z. There's a um, there's a there's a there's a newer like connection to sort of like a queer culture and pro LGBTQ that's connected to ska now, which is new. Like I'm not saying like there was like a, an anti LGBTQ sentiment before with ska, but it's um it's much more tied to it now. Like I just like the the people I'm getting the younger people I'm getting to know on Twitter that are really into ska now, so many of them are like, you know, LGBTQ and like they see they see ska very much as their own. I think some of that too is I think some of because some of the younger musicians are themselves queer, and uh, you know, so it's 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 almost like I really like I think it's cool that that ska. The, the way it evolves, this is like a natural evolution for ska. So it's like whoever is active in it sort of takes ownership of it and kind of recontextualizes it and it becomes true, even if it wasn't true a decade earlier. That's interesting because I, I mean, we started all this whole conversation with me being like, oh, well, it was just a way, you know, you could express yourself. Nobody cares. And I wonder how much that has to do with that. You know, yeah. growing obviously a community where for them it's it's a you know if I'm going to be what I'm going to be, if there's a home for me where people will just accept you for exactly who you are, yeah, ska seems to be a great place for that. Yeah, and you have Jeremy. Jeremy from Ska Two Network is non-binary and very open about it. And then we are the union. The album that they put out this year, the, 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 a really good album, is um, about is about the singer. Uh, coming out as a trans woman and so it's kind of a the album really documents a lot of that journey and it really has resonated with that community as well um and there's a lot of like other like lesser known bands where there's a lot of like queer members and stuff uh you know in the, new, in the newer ska scene so sure it's interesting it's interesting it's really cool yeah it's it's if that baggage starts going away <laughs> coupled with such a uh, in-depth kind of uh, review, if you will, of the history uh, uh, in defense of Ska, the book, obviously, and with mm-hmm. your podcast. Like, I really feel like, again, I'm barely into it. It's like 300 some odd pages. <laughs> so I'm barely into it. And I'm already like, oh, my God, like I, I already appreciate it that much more because I have a better understanding of the history. And mm-hmm. even like through all this, like there was a... um. I watched on, uh, I think it was Noisy. They have like a little 45-minute documentary of Two-Tone Ska. Even just yeah. watching that and being like, oh, shit. There's a there's so much more depth to this than, I mean, obviously, I've said it a hundred times, but then, then I've realized, but I guarantee you, most, most people don't realize the depth to this. And this book, I feel like, is going to be such a great exposure to people who want to get a little more of that appreciation for not just the music for what it is, but also for where it came from and how it progressed and how it slowly evolved. And granted, you know, Scott has to get through this last little stickler of being corny or whatever from the late nineties or the, the Uh commercialization of Scott, if you will. I feel like that's what really happened, right? Just like with grunge, it was just commercialized to the max and then burnt out like a flame and all done. But once it gets past that, there's definitely a lot more there. I feel like that's coming. Yeah, I think so for sure. I mean, I think some of the way it was commercialized, I think was, was, was kind of part of the uphill battle, you know, and see, the thing is a lot of those bands like continued, they continued on. Like we're talking about real big fish. I mean, these bands, even if they were quote unquote, one hit wonders, they had longevity in a way that I think a lot of the nineties one hit wonder bands did not. And that's because like Scott is, has like an appeal to it, you know, and an ongoing appeal. So real big fish, for instance, 
have had a pretty solid career for the last two decades and they've played decent sized rooms. So is it because they had one or two hits in the nineties or is it something more than that? Cause they're kind of seen as a, a band with a hit or two in the nineties and whoa, they're still touring, but they kept putting out records. They kept playing pretty good sized rooms. I don't know. It's it's, I think you can argue that. Yeah. Maybe I think the hits help them have enough of a, enough of a like exposure enough exposure you know to kind of get it out there to enough people but it you know it continued on and then young people would discover it like a lot of young people discovered like yourself like it's not like you were listening to MTV or watching MTV in 1997 and discovered real big fish it's like no nope. so people <laughs> just just kind of stumbled on it somehow you know in the 2000s and it's like oh Oh, this band, and this is a band I can go see because they're on the touring network. And so, right. then, yeah, so they go, they're a fan. They're a fan of Real Big Fish because of that, because they're a band that's still accessible. Um, they're a band that's out there. They're a band that's going to like put out a new record, you know? And so you can kind of, you can be an active fan of them. So that's going on too. So, so I don't know. It's really complex. It's just complicated, you know? I, yeah, but I it's, think- it's complicated in a way that's engaging. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's not just complicated for sake of being complicated. You know, there's There's, nothing wrong with it being complicated. I think it's just the fact that people want to make fun of it and simplify it. That's the only reason why it almost becomes like a little bit like defensive, like, well, actually, you know, it's way more complicated than that. You know, (laughs) that's that's only because there's always people that want to be like, oh, yeah, that's dumb. (laughs) This thing that happened. (laughs) Uh, Well, I, I appreciate all the time you've given me, Aaron. Um, anybody listening at this point, go check it out in defense of ska. Uh, I know it's on Amazon for sure. I'm sure it's in other places. I'm sure it's in indie bookstores. If not, I'm sure you can ask for it. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you go to any indie bookstore and they don't have it and you ask them to order it, they will order it. So yeah, whatever, whatever your comfort level is, if you want to take the convenient route of getting on Amazon, that's fine. If you want to go to your bookstore or library or, you can go to uh, bookshop.org is another place you can order it. Um, it's probably going to be a little bit more than Amazon, but it's going to support indie bookstores and it's still fairly convenient. So it it's fine with me. However, people get it because there's all there's different. It, there's, it benefits me and it benefits my publishers in different ways, but there's always a benefit. So I, I'm, I support sure. however people want to get it, you know absolutely well it's accessible anywhere if if you can check out the podcast in defense of ska check out aaron on all social media platforms in defense of ska i'll have all the links in the description as well Uh, again thank you so much for your time man all right thank you